you know, let's take, do a quick. All right, got it. Let's do um, a quick recap of the messages that uh, mom has talked about over the past three weeks. Uh, one of the things that she recently talked about was about praise being an investment. Okay. That's extremely important. I want to keep that as a, as a, as a theme um, and a part of in the message. Okay. And she talked about praise being an investment and how it opens doors and how it causes fortresses to fall flat. Okay. The second part of it that she talked about, this was last, uh, last Sunday was about not muddying the waters, uh, which is very important to have clarity of vision, clarity of focus and clarity of potential impact. Okay. I was thinking about that this week, um, kind of talking with the, the kiddos and doing the daddy thing as I, as I have come to know and love. Um, and what I realized is that, you know, mudding water is, is very simple. Um, it's very minute actions. It's allowing your, your vision and your sight to be skewed by doing something that doesn't necessarily uh, fall in line with the, with the impact that you're trying to actually go for. Um, and I thought about that in light for financial, uh, financial literacy day. And I asked God, I was like, what is it that you really want me to talk about? You know, what is it, the word that you have for me to be able to speak on? And so the, to, the title of today's uh, message is relational investment. I have a couple people on here relationally that came out just because it's me. Um, I have other people that came out because you're, you know, relationally, you're part of the house. Deacon Case, Apostle Case, good brother, good brother. As I said, relational investment is the title of today's message. Um, if anyone has ever had counseling in any way, shape, or form from this house, whether it's uh, prophetic counseling or um, the, uh, the courses that, that dad actually teaches on apostolic mentoring or the courses that mom actually teach on prophetic counseling, um, one of the things that they talk about is understanding where you're at and locating where you're at at that particular time. So the ability to do that allows for you to be able to understand first and foremost, what you're clothed in at that particular point in time. It doesn't mean what God clothed you in. It has to do with what you're clothed in, what you are allowed yourself to be surrounded by. And so many of us have dealt with um, challenges, troubles, conflicts, and problems over the past roughly two years, um, if not longer. And for some reason, we've allowed our sight to change, our vision to change, the hopes that we had and the desires that we had to kind of take a back burner because we're, you know, we're in a pandemic or because, you know, there's a loss of jobs or because there's people that have gotten sick or because your, your financial impact has, has potentially changed a little bit, but that has nothing to do with it. The very last uh, story that I'm going to share with you guys, and, and, and this is going to hopefully encourage you very a lot, but first I want to give you the terms that we're going to talk about. Um, as I said, today's message is entitled relational investment. But there's four specific words. Um, I want, to, want you to write down the letters and I'll give you the exact words as we approach the letters. So the first letter is V as in Victor. V as in Victor. The second letter is E as in Edward. E as in Edward. The third letter is S as in Sam. And the last letter is T as in Tom. So I'm giving names because they're a little bit easier and you know, That'll help everybody stay, stay close. So for the first one, the V as in Victor, um, let me ask you guys a question. And I want you to feel free to type in the chat. I'm, you know, I'm flexible. I like to see people respond and actually talk back to me. So uh, without having Joey unmute everybody, what I'd like to ask each of you is, um, what does investment mean to you? What does investment mean to you? You can just type it in the chat for everybody. So let's see, and I'll read out a couple of them. What does investment mean to you? All right. Somebody give me some answers. Come on, let me see. Kind of unmute. You can put your hand up or go ahead and say, putting time into something that will pay off. Okay, that's what Deshaun says. Anybody else? Um, David and Ruthie putting into something, putting some, in, into something to gain something in the end. Investment is a system of saving and preparing for the future. Sean says legacy. Anybody else? Legacy? Okay. All right. Giving your time, treasure, and talent to something you value. Excellent. So these are all good, all good answers. Um, thank you each for sharing. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, let's go back to the origin of what investment actually is. Um, 
investment comes from Latin. It actually means, it comes from a Latin word that is investir, which actually means to clothe or to surround. To clothe or to surround. Okay? So if investment means to clothe or to surround, and it's a military term, then where did we get the understanding of it only being financial? Where did we relegate it to having something to do with money and nothing to do with potential impact of the energy, the time, the words, anything it is that we have that we can give back into this earth to cause an increase? Where did, where did that concept come from? I don't know in your life where it came from, but I can tell you a little about where it came from in my life. So firstly, um, I got a couple people on here that are, you know, long, 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 long friends um, that I want to thank for joining and for hopping on and listening. Uh, but one of the things that value that I learned that that was beyond, um, you know, money was when, you know, you have conflict when you're younger, when you're growing up. And as you grow and you you deal with some of these challenging situations and God put these friends in your life. Um, at different opportunities as you're growing and he puts these uh, these men and these women um, over, over you to be mentors or to be um, people that will help, you know, challenge you or spur you to grow. And I remember just a, a couple of quick examples. Um, Aaron, Aaron is one of my oldest friends from the time I moved back from from uh, Texas up to PA. We've been friends for literally over 30 years. We've watched everybody go from, you know, early, at a, early, early childhood all the way through, you know, grown men with kids that are, you know, either going to college or going to high school. So Aaron's seen me through a lot of different things and has given me wisdom in different regards over that time period, but he's also held me accountable. And the relational investment, and this is, I'm using Aaron as an example, but I got many other friends on here, my boy Mike, um, my boy Vargo. Um, these are brothers that have been with me literally for at least more than 20 years, if not close to 20 years. And in varying regards, each one of them has given a certain value based on the perspective and the challenges that they faced, the problems that they've encountered and the things that they've overcome and have encouraged me. So what I learned from that was that valuation has more to do with your understanding of what it is that the, what is said or what is done and the potential impact of that thing. And I re relate that to um, Exodus four chapter or chapter four, verse two, um, where Moses is sitting there with the burning bush and you know, he's given excuses um, as to why it is that he shouldn't be the the person. You know, he shouldn't be placed in a situation to help deliver the, this entire generation and the successive generations from bondage, um, specifically the Israelites. And he says, he's like, you know, but God, I can't do and all of these, all these different things that he lists as God's given him answers. And he's like, but you know, I'm not an eloquent, I'm not an eloquent speaker or, but God, but I don't know, you know, I don't know the people or they don't know me or, or they're used to, they're used to seeing me historically as somebody that was in, you know, the King's house as a son of, of the people that were oppressing, um, oppressing them. And, you know, God asked him and he specifically says, he's like, Moses, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? And Moses replies that it's a rod or a staff, something that's you know very, very common. Dad preached on this a while back. But basically the importance of, of the staff is really, is, is very relevant because these are everyday items. These are everyday opportunities. These are everyday things that you have the ability to utilize and make a positive impact in subsequent generations. Not just in the people's life that you're seeing at that point in time. You have the ability to instill value, to give back something positive to change potentially the impact of their future. But yet we want to worry about, is there money tied to it? Money is more than just printed paper. Money is about, you know, it's in, in God we trust as they call it. <laughs> in God we trust. But the truth of the matter is we're responsible to, to trust God for everything. Not just the financials, not how much money is in our bank, not how, you know, how large our house is or how much it's worth or what is the market going to do in five years or in six months, whether or not our job is going to close, you know, where, where my assets are going to be in five years. We're responsible for the impact. That's where valuation starts. Valuation starts with you understanding the impact of the decision that you're making and deciding to change the trajectory of that impact. If you got somebody that's down and out and you know they're down and out and you got, you know, you're down to your last forty dollars and they're like, hey, look, you know, I just need twenty dollars to get through the get through the week. And you go ahead and you give it to them. They don't know where you're at, but they do know the impact and they know that you made a sacrifice for them. 
So just like Brother Moses in, 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 the, in, the, in the wilderness, as it were, um, by the burning bush, with something in his hand that he, for all intents and purposes, really didn't understand the final value and the impact of that. That same staff was going to be used in the future to bring clarity to the oppressed sight of the Israelites so that they knew that Moses was the person that God sent. So I want to encourage each of us, firstly, to when we get up in the morning, Ask God, simply, God, give me sight to be able to see the value of the opportunities that you've provided for me this day and to maximize those things. It's a prayer I've been praying for years. Give me sight to see the value of the opportunities that you've placed in front of me today and maximize those opportunities. That's valuation. Secondly, uh, the second word, E, as in Edward, uh, that word is actually education. And I'm going to give you guys a statement that all of us should know. I think most of us have gone through children's school and, or uh, children's Sunday school or, uh, or Debbie's uh, children's church at one point or another. Very simple and straightforward. Train up a blank in the way that they should go. Type it out in the chat. What's that word? Train up a blank in the way that it should go. And there's a second part to it. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But train up a blank in the way that it should go. Excellent child. I, I love y'all, man. Listen, y'all y'all out here. Y'all doing y'all thing. That's what I'm talking about. Gold stars around the board. Train up a child. Hmm. A child. A child. And the second part, you're probably going to figure it out, but the second part is so that when they are old, they will not blank from it. So that when they are old, they will not blank from it. Depart. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Depart. Those two words, I want you to write down. I want you to keep this in your mind as you continue, you progress, and you're developing your, your strategy moving forward to maximize the relationships that God has given you and the opportunities that he set before you. Train up a, and I want you to change child, because I want you to think about this differently. I want you to see this differently. Train up your legacy. Train up your legacy in the way that it should go. Train up your legacy in the way that it should go. And then the second portion of it, so that when it is old, it will not separate itself from it, okay? So again, train up your legacy in the way that they should go, so that, so that it should go, so that when it is old, it will not depart from it. Now there's a reason specifically why I changed those two words. Um, firstly, when you look at legacy, legacy is something that's generational. Legacy doesn't have a, a direct impact on today, but you're thinking about tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow. Okay. When you train up your legacy, when you're, when you're doing things that is building towards the end goal that is generational, the steps that you make are much more careful than it was if it was something that would bite you in the butt tomorrow or will bite you in the butt later this afternoon. Very, very careful, methodically planned and thought about, you know, what if this impact happens? You know, what if what if the economy changes? What if this, what if that? You're taking into account all of the potential impacts to minimize what it is that your seed is able to accomplish, okay? That's the difference when you're planning for your legacy, okay? And then secondly, when it talks about so that when you are old, it will not depart from it. It will not separate itself from it. As you're facing the challenges, the troubles, the conflicts, the different things that you have to grow through, you know, the family members that are pulling on you, the financial impact that somebody's negative decision has had on your life, or somebody that didn't come through on what they said they were going to come through, or somebody that said that they were going to show up and never showed up, and the disappointment that you felt. As you face all of these things, as you face the potential impact of failure, the potential impact of success, that's the nature of life. But don't allow the things that you face, the challenges and the opportunities to dissuade you from the impact of the original vision. When I had my kids, I didn't think about, you know, how much money I had in the bank. I didn't ask God, you know, is this going to be enough to make sure they are able to build a life, not just, you know, sustain them. I didn't ask him that. My prayer was very different. My prayer changed from literally me being singly focused on Alfred and me being singly focused on, you know, what it is that Alfred and Deshaun are doing to now all of a sudden, hey, look, bro, you can't make no missteps. God, I need to see clearly in this thing. I need to make sure that I'm setting my kids up for five, for 10, for 15, for 20, for 50 years from now, 
so that they're going to make a positive impact so that all of the things that you are investing in me that I'm giving to them, that I'm working with them on, that I'm developing and developing in them through your tutelage and through your through your site, that it has the maximum impact that it can have in this earth. That's a relational investment. That's important. That's where the focus needs to be at. As you educate yourself, first and foremost, and you educate your legacy and you, you know, you follow the, the footprint of people that are wiser and the impact that God has given you. And you ask him for clarity of your steps, for clarity of what it is that he's saying to you, for clarity of what it is that you're supposed to speak. And for who it is that you're allowing to be an authorized user of your vision. Who it is that you're allowing to be an authorized user of your vision somebody who has the ability to make decisions that will negatively impact you or cause you to have to bear a burden or a weight or a debt that they are not physically responsible for. As you allow people to be authorized users of your vision, as you allow people to be authorized users of your vision, the impact that your vision can have has not changed. But the impact that you feel from people who are not authorized to carry that burden does change. So be careful, be wise, and allow the Lord to educate you in everything and every step that you're making. Because I can tell you, if it wasn't for some of these brothers and the good advice that they've given, not including you know many of you in the time of need, Apostle Cubit, um, uh, Prophetess Priscilla, you know, Prophetess Lisa or Ambassador Lisa, you know, I gotta get the gotta get the term right, my bad. Um, and of course, mom and dad, many of these situations, many of these times where you've allowed people the the authorization to see a little bit or a glimpse of what it is that God is doing in your life, or where he's brought you through, or what he's taken you to specifically, there's times where you're not gonna be by yourself. There's times where you're gonna need somebody in your corner that's gonna be there to educate you. It's not just about educating you today. It's about educating the impact of the legacy that you're creating. And so many times, if you haven't had people that you're responsible for, if you don't know what it's like to have to be watchful for, some, for someone else to make sure that they return back home the same way that they left, get underneath somebody that does. Because the decision-making process, like mom and dad have, the decision-making process is very different. It's very careful, it's very methodical, it's well-educated. It's taken with much prayer and consolation. They're not just giving you something that's gonna cause harm to you. In the same way you wouldn't give something like that to your children. That is a relational investment. That has the impact of perpetuity for long, long, long generations outside of just the $20 that I spent today or the $50 that I gave yesterday. It's bigger than that. I'm aligning myself, which brings me to my, my third term, um, S is in Sam. The word S is specifically stance, S-T-A-N-C-E. Um, the scripture for, for stance is uh, Judges 6, 25 through 27, S-T-A-N-C-E, stance. And mom, I know she's listening in the background. This is like one of her favorite scriptures, where she's talking about uh, Gideon, a uh, mighty man of God, back when the, in the wine press and you know, sitting there threshing, threshing wheat, basically using something, getting something through to be able to use it, not necessarily designed for its original purpose, but making it happen. Um, Gideon was back there and he's, you know, dealing with the, the oppression of what it is that was, was coming, coming before him to basically enslave him. Um, make it simple. Um, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him as, as an ambassador and as an emissary and was, hey, mighty man of God, basically saying, hey, bro, listen, I know what you're about to face. That ain't got nothing to do with what I called you to. It is what it is, whether you accept it or you don't. I called you to this, regardless of what the circumstance is. I called you to this. So you got to make a stance. And he told him specifically what to do to make a stance. He told him, hey, listen, go in the back, cut down the altars, remove them. The, the, your dad's told them the, gener the generational totem, totems, the things that they tied the sel themselves to, the things that they were worshiping, the things that took their attention away from what it was that I caused them to do and whose people they were. Go back there, cut that thing down. Non-negotiable. Go back there, cut that thing down. 
And then he gave him instructions after that on what he was supposed to do. Many of us are dealing with generational curses because of the, uh, the things that our, our parents or our grandparents or our great grandparents went ahead and erected and began to serve. They went ahead and erected and began to serve. For some of us, that's divorce. They erected that thing and they served it. I'll never again. I'll never again. I'll never again. For other people, it was a lack of trust. I'll never again. I'll never again. I'll never again. I'm, I'll, I will be the person that makes the impact on my own, regardless of what I know or what I don't know. I can handle it on my own. I don't need nobody else. Some of them, that was the totem that they built out. If you've ever been through counseling, like I said, one of the first thing they're going to do is they're going to locate you. They're going to find out whatever those fig leaves are that you went ahead and you clothed yourself with and the stance that you took. Stance is extremely important in anything that you do, being on the right side or being on the wrong side, setting yourself up to attack or setting yourself up to defend, just like playing any sports. And everybody who knows me love knows that I love you know basketball specifically to play. I hate to watch it, but I love to play it. Um, one of the things in basketball um, that is extremely important is, is stance, as with anything else. Positioning yourself to be able to, you know, to score or to steal or to, you know, defend, whatever the case may be, positioning yourself. And my dad was one of, one of actually the first coaches that I've ever had in my life. Um, and because it was that, my dad was extremely hard on me, or so I thought. But what he taught me was that whatever you align yourself with early is the same thing that you're always going to draw to when you get older. So those times when he would take me, you know, when I was four or five, six years old, take me down to the basketball court to watch him play, you know, he had a very different game than what I had. You know, he was down in the post banging on people because he was, you know, he's 255, nine. I'm 160 pounds soaking wet on my best day <laughs> and learning a different skill set. But also by watching my father play basketball in a very different role than what I would be playing, I learned how to defend against them. My homie Jahan on here, Jahan used to be a monster in the paint back when we were in college. Um, and I mean, literally would come in, he'd come down, hit a point, you hit it with a spin, boom, shoulder. Next thing you know, it was a basket or it was a rebound, whatever the case may be. But Jahan taught me something that was very interesting one day. We was out there playing and we were uh, basically doing conditioning. Um, and he's like, man, he's like, bro, you know, you know, how, how is it that you conquered asthma so that you can continue to, to run? And I was like, Remember, I was having a conversation. I'm like, bro, I used to have to, I used to have to, you know, bring my inhaler to practice and all that stuff. And you know, my doctor told me, you know, I was gonna have to take the inhaler for the rest of my life and all this because I was asthmatic, so forth and so on. And I'm sitting there and I'm hearing this thing and I'm like, who are you talking to? I'm not in agreement with that. Nah, bro, I'm not. I'm not signing off on that. You're not authorized to make that decision for me. I'm the only person that's gonna do that. And so what I learned in that situation was I don't have to subscribe to everything everybody else says. And I turned around and I said, you know what? I don't care how bad it hurts, how bad it burns. I will not have to use this daggone inhaler for the rest of my life. I refuse. And I would take it with me to practice just in case it was an urgent situation. But I said, not on my watch. This is not going down like that. And I will tell you, the last time I actually took an inhaler, I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And that was it. Other than that, that same inhaler all the way through expiration date, all them years, sat in that book bag and I continued to run. Regardless, I made a stand that day. I said, nah, not on my watch. This is not going to turn around and limit my ability. I refuse. I'm not going to be sitting there. I can't score the points that I want to score. I can't run the court like I want to run because I got to worry about this little plastic thing with this metal tube in it. Not doing that. And I said that in and of itself taught me some things, even as a child, I have the ability to make a stand on. I took a stand in that thing, and I'm encouraging each one of you to take a stand against the, the challenges, the troubles, the conflicts that your family seemingly was steamrolled by. Those people in your life that may have had a divorce, those people in, in a life that may have said, I can't trust so-and-so, or I can't trust a certain type of people, or I will never make above, or you will never make above a certain dollar amount, or that your impact will not be what you, what you design it to be. You each have to make a stance, just like I have to make a stance on a daily basis. 
my stance continuously, no matter what it is that I face. Hey, God, give me the opportunity to bless somebody today. However it is, let me hear you clearly and let me be able to make an impact positively for you. That's a relational investment. I gave somebody, I had like $50 in my cash app earlier this year. It was like my, I think probably the second day of the year. And I was going to buy something from, um, from off of Facebook Marketplace. And I, so I do it from time to time. But um, something said, look into the guy a little bit further, right? So I clicked on a dude's profile. And this is just, this is related to stance and also education. Um, but I clicked on a guy's profile. And I went back and I was kind of reading through some of the posts that he had made recently. And come to find out, you know, the guy had a mother who was deathly ill. And because she was deathly ill, um, she lost her job. She wasn't able to take care of them. And about three months or three months into or before the end of last year, his father died, who was a sole breadwinner of the house. And they basically got evicted from their home um, just before Christmas. And so I'm learning all of this through you know, reading, and this is just a series of different things I'm reading through based on his post, you know, he's looking for a shelter, talking about is there anybody that can, you know, that can help with um, with getting his mom emergency care because they don't have health insurance, they're, they're homeless for all intents and purposes. And so I reached out to him, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, um, and I knew where I was at, I knew what the, the, the things were that I had to pay for, and I was thinking about, you know, all these bills, the enemy comes with you with bills first. Hey, you know, you got these responsibilities you got to take care of. You know, this is needed. You know, you owe, you know, you know, you're late or you're past due. Or if you don't pay it by this date, you will be past due. They're going to charge you this fee. And the enemy, that's the first thing that he does. And one of the things that mom actually had taught me, and this is probably the first like two years of us getting married, was that wherever the enemy puts his finger at, it knows he knows that you have the potential to have the greatest impact. So when he tells you don't give that additional money, he knows it's, you know, there's a perpetuity in that thing. He knows that there's a there's a value that you're not seeing in whatever it is, the amount that God told you to give. Right. He knows that even though we might not always discern that. OK, so back to the, back to the story. So I reached out to the guy and I was like, hey, you know, um, I was really interested in purchasing whatever the item was. I don't even remember what it was at this point. I said, but unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to come out. You know, I have other responsibilities I got to take care of. I said, but you know, would, would you mind sending me your cash app? And he was like, you know, he kind of took a second. I saw the little, you know, the little dots, you know, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, is he going to say something rude or, you know, what is he going to do? And the guy's like, um, he's like, if you don't mind me asking, you know, what do you need my cash app for? And I said, you know, I said, I told him, I said, I just, I just felt an urge to give you what it is that I have in my cash app at this point in time. And I said, I don't, I don't know why I said, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just following and I'm being obedient. And he was like, you know, he sent me the cash app and I sent him what the money was that I had in it. And <laughs> probably for like the next five minutes, and it wasn't even a big amount. It wasn't like, you know, triple digits or, or quadruple digits, but I sent him, you know, double digits. And the guy, you would have thought that I gave the dude $10,000 or put him up with a brand new house the way that he responded. And talking about how, you know, he's reached out to friends and family members and nobody helped him at all. He said for the past two weeks, he's been living in his car with his mom for a Ford Focus. And I had one of those, so I know how small they are. And his mom stretched out on the backseat of the Ford Focus as she is ailing and dying for two weeks. That included Christmas and New Year's. Everybody was out celebrating. Everybody out was making promises about what they were not going to keep in the new year, making resolutions, signing up for gym memberships they had no desire to actually follow through on, making decisions to waste opportunities that God has given. The energy. I made a simple decision to bless somebody that I didn't even know. I didn't know what the impact would be. How many opportunities have all of us collectively, all 30 or so of us that are on this call had and walked away from because we let bills take the stance for us? How many? How many times are we going to do that in the future? How many times are we going to choose the relationship we have with our bills over the relationship that God is allowing us to develop with people? How many times are we going to make excuses? How many times are we going to resort to what Moses did and not value the things that God has placed and surrounded us with. How many times? 
speaking to all of us, not just y'all. I'm talking to myself too. Our desire, not just as Christians, first and foremost, but as people, is to change people from a negative place, from a restrictive place, to a more open place where they have the opportunity to flourish and succeed. Simple and straightforward. Ain't none of us bound by whatever words other put other people put on us. None of us. The only vision and legacy we're required to follow through on and maximize and return is the one that God gave us long before we came on the scene. Each one of us are an investment into this world. Regardless of what you feel your ailment is or the thing that you lack, you're an investment. God put things in you that will never, 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 that combination will never be reproduced. The impact that you have will never be limited outside of you. You're the only person that has the ability to limit your impact or to reel it in or to act like it's not as important. But if you train up your legacy in the way that it should go, when it gets old, it will not separate itself from that vision. It will not. Each one of us, at one point, were a child. We needed help. We needed somebody to pour into us. And in many ways, we're all children at heart. I mean, I hope most of us are children at heart. I hope we, ain't, we haven't allowed for fear to speak louder than um, excitement that we would have as a child to be able to make an impact. I watch my, my two sons now, like, man, they, aside from them fighting incessantly, um, the biggest thing they want to do is they want to make an impact. There you go. Hey, Sean, they want to make an impact. They want daddy to be excited about what they're excited about. They want daddy to take an interest. They want daddy to spend time. They want daddy to place value. They want daddy to place value on what it is that they see is important. That's what they want. They want the opportunity to be able to be daddy's focus for even if it's five minutes, even if it's five minutes, every single one of us have the opportunity as an adults to make a bigger impact than we ever could have made as a child. Every single one of us. We didn't have the restrictions as a child that we have, but we have more knowledge now. We have more wisdom. We're more educated. If we haven't allow allowed the trials of life to limit what it is that we can see, if we can get back to that childlike heart that we had to accomplish the dreams that God has given us, our impact is immeasurable. It's generational. It's an investment in subsequent generations after us our impact as individuals. We could change the course of history, just the people on this call. If I went through and I polled everybody about what they do, we have enough millionaires on this call right now that in five to 10 years, we, that we all could be billionaires and turn around and change in the, the course of this history, claiming this thing back for the kingdom, changing those mountains, going back to, as, as Miles Monroe called it, getting the keys of the kingdom. We're sons and daughters. Ain't, ain't no higher calling than that, other than, I mean, what, friend? We are relational. We got people in our lives that care. Not because we're giving them $100 a week or $2,000 a week. They care. They genuinely care for our success. They genuinely care for our well-being. You know, they cut our butts when we need to be cut too, like a good parent should. But at the end of the day, they inv they'll invest anything that they have. I watched, I watched Dad for two years work with us on this house in his 60s. Now, mind you, I work. I have no problem working. There ain't nobody that's ever going to tell you I'm lazy. I get, uh, and I start working with dad. Listen, listen, I'm starting to get a headache, bro. I, hey, I got to go get something to eat. He, he, when I say he works, there, there's normal work. Then there's like, what they call them? The, um, the, 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 the big horses that like pull the drones, you know what I mean? That plow the field and do the work. The ones that don't need a whole, whole lot of water, but they get the job done and make sure it's done right. The ones that take a stance and set the field, that's what we sit under. Every single one of us have, have been impacted and challenged to make a stand. Every single one of us. I'm not the only one. So if they thought 
not thought, I'm not even gonna say they thought, if they knew that you were worthy of making an investment with everything they have, how is it that we don't allow ourselves to see that same value? How is it that we devalue or we don't understand the full valuation of what it is that we're being, we're being given? How? It's a question each one of us has to ask ourselves. Did we make an impact today positively on somebody? Because the message was on Sunday. You have four days to get something done positively. You have four days to impact at least one person positively. Have you done it? Well done, my good and faithful. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful. Every day I want to hear that. Now I just want it's time to go home. God, did I maximize at the end of the night when I lay my pillow, when I lay my head on the pillow, whether or not it's something positive or something negative, what is it that I sowed today and what's the impact of that thing? That's my stance. That's what I want to know. I encourage each one of us to want to, to actually get to know that as well. I gave y'all three, three words thus far. I'm going to get to my fourth one. Um, the last one is for T. T is in Tom. The word for T is touch. This one is a bit more challenging, but um, I want to talk about um, the relationship with with Papa Chuck and, and with Dad and, and that that generational impact. Um, when I preached probably about two years ago, I talked about how uh, Papa Chuck, when I first met him, he come he stayed at the house and he was like, you know, he said uh, he had a book for me, and he gave me this book and it was called um, Real Leaders Like Their Coffee Black. That was the name of the book. Really short, only about maybe 40 pages, give or take. And I remember sitting there and, you know, he gave me the book and he's like, um, he basically said, you know, <laughs> he said, um, read it. He said, and I'm going to have you give a, a summary of it in front of the church. And I'm like, when? Mind you, we had church the very next day. So I had basically overnight to read this entire, or what I thought I had was the next day for him to actually pull me up on the stage and have me give a summary of this thing. And I remember sitting there thinking, and I'm like, did he give me this book because I'm black? Like, what's the reason? What's, what's about these leaders in coffee black? What, what, you know, what, is, what does it have to do with? I'm sitting there, I'm, look, I'm looking at the cover, you know, never judge a book by a cover, of course, but I'm like, Papa Chuck is, is a Caucasian gentleman for those who don't know, but he's from Indiana, um, literally one of the most Caucasian towns I've ever been to in my life. Literally, like, we were the only um, melanin, uh, melanin black people that were there. And one of the most welcoming places, and most, in, in all honesty, it's been more diverse in that place than I've seen in a group of people that look just like me because of the type of environment that he fostered. He wouldn't allow you to sit next to the same person next day. If he saw you there, now nah, you got to go. You got to meet somebody else. Some of the people I got now that are that look different from me, that are close friends, started from that initial interaction. But with that particular book, I started reading through it and there's a lot of things that it talked about story-wise about how it is that leaders that leaders pioneer basically was the theme of the book you know they don't look for things that are that that taste good they don't look for things that look good they don't look for things that are you know well cultivated that <laughs> that have already been for all intents and purposes commercialized they look for ways to make an impact that was the theme of the book and I said, I remember sitting there and after I finished reading it and I'm like, he's going to ask me to give a summary of his book tomorrow. And tomorrow never came. So long story short, I read the book overnight and didn't have to tell nobody nothing. But the funny part about that, I will never forget that book. And it wasn't because the speed that I read it with. It was because the fact that he trusted me to give people a summary of something that he knew would cause them to change their focus. He knew that that book had the ability to touch and change somebody's life. And it started with me. I still have that book to this day. I, I done probably read 70 books in a time period since he's given it to me. But I have that book. It's still one of my top tens. If we're sitting here as individuals and we've been invested in, how dare we not make the stand 
to make an impact positively with that vision. Like you talk about squandering, man, listen, if you knew the value of what it is that's been placed in you and the potential impact of that value, would you still make excuses? Would you? Would we? Not you, would we? Would we? When your value speaks beyond anything that you have that might potentially be a limiting factor, when that value, that vision, that legacy, that potential impact is so much high, more valued than anything that you could give as an excuse, anything. My family, my parents didn't go to college. I didn't come from millionaires. I don't have no money to start off. Nobody gave me an inheritance. My credit score is a 400. I don't know how that is, but my credit score is a 400. <laughs> Nobody in my family has been an entrepreneur. Nobody in my family has been wealthy. I don't know no rich people. I don't know anybody that owns a house in the suburbs. I don't know anybody that has an investment property. Whatever other excuses you've had, you know, throw some of them in the chats. Other people, other people can hear. Other people can read. What excuses have you given at any given point in time to basically rule yourself out? I don't know where to start. That's a good one. That's a really good one. I don't know where to start. Hmm. I don't know where to start. I'm afraid of technology. Sean throwing shots right now, but I'm going to let that slide. I'm going to let that slide. We got a couple older people on the call. I'm going to let that slide. <laughs> I don't like technology. I'm afraid to use it. But we got older people. I don't have nobody in my corner that can teach me. Go ahead. Throw some more in the chat. What other excuses have people been given? And have said, I've gotten too old. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like that one. I don't like talking to people. Okay. That's a good one as well. I'm a loner. It's too late. I want to tell you, I may fail. Ooh, ooh. You know what? We're going to pause right there. Hold on. I may fail. When I started speaking about um, life and the potential impact and talking about that thing and training up a child in the way that they should go, or training up your legacy in the way that it should go so that when it's older, it will not separate from that. Life has the ability to limit if you allow it. Your vision and your perspective based on your failures. It doesn't have that on the other side based on your success. It doesn't. Anybody that's ever been successful will tell you the next thing that they're looking for is the next way to succeed. But you'll never hear that from anybody that's failed. And you also never hear that from anybody that's never started. You never start, you never fail. If you fail, you're not looking for more ways to fail. You're gonna to continue to look for ways to succeed. Everybody that's a multi-millionaire, multi-billionaire in one way, shape, one way, shape or form has been successful at something. And he said, I've, Aaron already said, I've, I've given so much already. I've depleted basically what it is that I that I thought I could give. I've spent it all and I haven't seen a reward. How many times we, we've been there? I know with this house process, I can tell you I've been there. I looked at my bank account a couple of times and was like, how much you make again? And I know each one of us have had, the, had those opportunities. Making a stance to value the investment that we've already been given and the potential impact of that investment is not a task that any of us should take lightly. At all. We can't allow the challenges that we faced to limit the impact that we can make. We can't allow the limitations that we've seen that other people have been embraced by or have embraced to be ours. How many of us on this call, just raise your hand, you ain't gotta put nothing in the chat. How many of us on this call was at any given point raised by a millionaire or above? Anybody? Okay, nobody? Okay, 
I won't put my hand up. And the reason why is because the title of this message again is relational investment. The mantle that the house carries and that dad has embraced and mom have embraced from Apostle Chuck is something that's priceless. You can't put a value on that. We've been given the thing that the world needs. We've been given an example. We're continuously given an example. What we haven't done is we haven't executed. We haven't chosen to willingly make an impact positively based on what it is that we've been given. We haven't chosen that. If we did, when I asked, hey, over the past four days, how many people have we impacted positively? Everybody would want to hop off and be like, listen, earlier today, I talked to 10 different people. We talked about all these different business opportunities. I got a meeting set up with so-and-so. I reached out to the mayor. I did blah, 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 whatever the case may be that makes a positive impact. Because we, like I said, we're investments in this world. We ain't just people. We're sons and daughters. We carry something. We have a responsibility to leave this world better than it was when we came in. And it ain't just about the money. It's about the impact. God gave every one of us talents, talents and talents. He gave us the ability to maximize our treasure, our heart, our heart, our heart. He gave the ability to maximize our heart for each other, our heart towards our leadership. Relationally, he gave us that ability. Are we maximizing it? Are we? If I asked each one of us truly to hop on this, to just shake their head yes or no, are you maximizing what it is that God gave you right now? Just shake your head yes, no, whatever. Not sure, just keep your head still. <laughs> Prophetess Lisa, I ain't gonna mess with you. <laughs> are we maximizing it? Are we making a willful decision to impact this world for the positive? I earlier in, in the message I talked about who we're who we're allowing to make an authorized user on our vision. At the end of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna give some a prophetic word. I don't know who it's for, but I wrote it down and so I'm gonna deliver it just like it was given to me. But I want you to 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 take into account because this is this is a financial literacy portion and this is specifically about relational investing. But I wanna make it very clear that Investment starts firstly in yourself. I think Prophetess Lisa, Ambassador Lisa talk, uh, put it in the chat, but it starts firstly with yourself. You can't give what hasn't been poured into you. And just likewise, you can't pour out what hasn't been poured into you. You can't receive what you're not open to. I refuse to die like I came into this world. I refuse. Les Brown said it like this. He said, you were born to do more than just pay bills and die. One of my favorite speakers, I have many of his, many of his materials. I probably got about four or five gigs worth of his stuff. You were born to do more than just pay bills and die. You were born more th than to just meet the responsibilities that life has put on you. You were born to make an impact. You were sown as a seed into this world to make an impact. If when you die, you've contributed to the benefit that have stuck in the graveyard, you didn't leave it all on the floor. We didn't leave it all on the floor. And it starts every day with a single decision to impact one person, then two people, then four people, than a thousand. Whatever impact it is that God gives you, whatever stage he puts you on, whatever platform, whatever people that he gives you the opportunity to speak to or to sow into, it's your responsibility to do that, just like it's mine. I don't take my job lightly as a father, as a husband, or what I do professionally. 
because I want to make an impact. People are out there dying right now, committing suicide right now because what they don't have in their hands or what they can't see the value of. I refuse to be a contributor to that. That's my stance. If nothing else by you knowing me, at minimum, you will get some laughter. At minimum. You will leave with at least a couple more abs than you came with. Guaranteed. Don't matter what the situation is. If nothing else, I can say that is a gift that I have definitely sold back into this world. Period. With the other gifts that God has given me, I have been willingly and intentional about making sure that I make the same impact. When I leave out of here, y'all y'all see my tombstone? Y'all better not let them put nothing but just numbers, a dash, and a number. I don't want to see that. Don't, don't even put numbers on my tombstone. He was born, he gave it all, and he went home. That's it. Alfred Impact Sloan. No, don't put impact on the, on the tombstone. <laughs> don't put impact on my tombstone. <laughs> No, but bringing it full circle, um, the difference, and I've learned this over the year between people that are poor, people that are wealthy and people that are rich, is that they understand the value of what it is that they have, what they have access to, how it can be utilized, and they have the system. They have the system to protect it against the wiles of this world. That's the difference. They have the system to become, to go from poor to rich or from rich to wealthy because of what it is that they have willingly decided to do because they take a value in the relationships that they have, the knowledge that they've built, the mentors that they have in their corner, the spiritual parenting that they've had. Some of them spiritual parenting, some of them, you know, just mentors, but they take a value in that and they understand, they study the systems that make these people successful. You wanna be successful? You don't study people that failed. I mean, you can, but in general, you study people that succeed. Ain't nobody looking up who the person was that died with the most debt. Nobody cares. Forbes is not reporting that on the 400 list because it don't matter. You leaving stuff, you leaving a void for other people to feel. That's what you're doing. That's not what billionaires do. That's not what people that are making impact do. Bill Gates, whether you like it or not, is out there right now making an impact, period. You go back, you can pull it up online. You look at how much some of these billionaires time is worth in minutes. They have a breakdown of it. Go and look at that. We have the same measure given to us in an investment from the time we came into this world, but yet we're not making the same impact because of our decisions. I will not be a part of that. And I pray each one of us have made the decision today, at least in a little bit that you've gotten from me to change what it is that your stance is, to change what it is that you will make impact wise into this earth. I hope, I hope that you've been encouraged. I really do. I hope that everybody's able to leave with something that they didn't come with, aside from a few laughs and looking at my handsome face. I pray that, and I wanna encourage each of us to understand that it's equally as important to hear from God when we're high as when we're low. Not when we're high like chiefing, but when we're up on the mountaintop. When we're up on the mountaintop, when we've, when we've, what we, when we, when we, when we've experienced what it is that we think success is, it's important for us not to muddy those waters no different than it's important for us not to muddy the waters when we really need to hear clearly from God. When you're in those situations and you don't know what to do or where to go or who to pull on or who to call, just as important as it is not to muddy the waters there, it's no different when you're on the mountaintop, when you reach whatever your level of success is. I know people I've talked to <laughs> in their 20s and have told me, I will never make $100,000 based on what it is that my job is slated. I will never make $100,000. I literally laughed at them. I laughed at them. You might not find it funny. Many of you may have never seen $100,000 in your, in your time of work. 
There's a guy that never made more than $14 an hour that left millions of dollars in an endowment. There is a lady who cleaned up houses, never made more than $12 an hour that left millions of dollars in an endowment. It's not about how much you make. It's about your heart and how you choose to position your heart to make an impact. How you choose to invest that thing that God gave you, that thing that he clothed you with and bought you, brought you into this world with to make an investment. Position your heart, position your sight, position your mouth. Just like they taught us when we was kids. Be careful, little ear, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And be careful, little mouth, what you say. These three things are what makes us an authorized user on other people's visions. Prophetess Beverly, when you came and you was like, listen, I have an idea for uh, the millennial explosion. You asked certain people. You didn't just pull on anybody. You asked certain people. You asked people that had a heart for what it was that you were trying to do. Right? That's what you did. You didn't come and say, hey, listen, you are under 25 years old. You need to be a part of this. You didn't come and do that. You judge based on hearts. Because the heart will make an impact that age and wisdom has nothing to do with. Lack of experience has nothing to do with. The heart will. Because the heart has the ability in it, those chambers, those chambers, those rooms, that your heart has, those places to be up to allow somebody to come and rest, to abide, to stay, to find peace, to be sheltered from the wiles and the pressures of life. Those chambers, you have the ability to give somebody a room in your heart to show them, just like mom and dad show us on a continual basis. Not one of us will say that they don't have a heart for us. Not one. I can say that, not as their son-in-law, but as a young man that met them through their daughter. I was encouraged before I decided that, you know, Deshaun was going to be my spouse. I left that room, aside from being scared of them, 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 them knives and swords and stuff that he got being introduced as a friend, um, aside from those things, I left the room more encouraged. If nothing else, I, I left the same way I came physically, not harmed, which I thought was going to happen. But I left there feeling like someone actually cared and somebody was willing to invest in me. And from that day to this, I've never once seen where dad said, hey, listen, Fred, you on your own, bro. Can't help you with that. Never. And I guarantee you, if we polled everybody on this call, it ain't never been about money. Ain't never been about what he had. Ain't never been about what he didn't have or mom didn't have. Two o'clock in the morning, if you call saying, listen, I'm on my face. I need prayer. I need you to stick with me. Who are you going to call? It ain't Ghostbusters. I can tell you that. Just like back in the day when I could call on my boys, listen, so-and-so got out of line. We're going to have to ride through. It is what it is. People don't make excuses. They know if you're in the time of need, it ain't about what they don't have. It ain't about what their bills are for tomorrow. I just wanna encourage each of us to really value the investment that we've been given. Tomorrow or today. She got people plugging in the, plug in the laptop. Huh? Encourage each of us to value the investment, the valuation. The inherent, you got it? The inherent intrinsic value that we've been given, the impact, the potential impact that we've been given before we came into this world, the education, the stance, and the touch, the potential impact of each one of the seeds that we've been given, and maximize it. I don't want any of us to go home 
and carry something that this world needed to a place that has no use of it. That's not what I want. That's not the desire that God has for us either. When we face the wiles and the trials of life, so what? It's a part of life. That doesn't mean it has to limit our vision. It doesn't mean it has to limit our impact. But it, it does mean that we're required to make an investment and it does mean that we're required to give back and it does mean that when we do get to wherever it is that we going, God's gonna ask, what did you do with what I gave? That's what he's gonna ask you. Plus minus nothing. God don't care about how many days he gave you on this planet. He care about, did you get the job done? Did you give your all? Did you make sure that you left this world with an indelible mark that nobody will ever be ever to, a, a, able to say that you didn't do. That's what he cares about. Not what job you had or how much money you made or what car you drove or how many sneakers you had or who you knew or how many celebrities you met. He don't care about that. What he cares about is what did you do with what it was that I gave you? Either you did something positive for my kingdom or you didn't. Either you did something positive for my kingdom or you didn't. That's all he's going to ask you. Plus, minus nothing. Every single day that we are given, God says, hey, listen, I'm blessing you with the opportunity to do something that will change the course of history. Every single day. Do you know what it's like to get that? How can you not wake up excited? How? How can you not wake up wanting to love somebody more on that day, how can you not wake up wanting to share what it is that God did? Apostle Cuban, when he was in the prison, working with these guys that are, for all intents and purposes, confined, to put it mildly, confined. They are limited in everything that they can do and who it is that they can impact. If he can go in a place like that and impact them, brothers, I'm out here in full freedom. Why can't I? Why? Why? because I'm not investing relationally. That's why. So in closing, I want to challenge each of us, first and foremost, to understand the value of the relationships that we have, the things that God has put into our hearts, the investments that he's made, and turn our hearts back to one another. Period. Encourage somebody to tonight if you can. Well, it's kind of late, but encourage somebody tonight and definitely tomorrow and every every single day. Just one person, if nothing else. Make an investment, a positive investment in someone else's life and say, God, I sowed the seed, water it and make the increase. If you can do that 365 days in one year and you die in 50 years, you will have made an indelible impact on this on this earth period. That's me. That's you. Be encouraged. Don't let your eyes be narrowed again by what it is that you faced, but instead continue to pray and ask God for wisdom to see the opportunities that he's placed before you and how it is that you are to make an investment in this earth with what it was that he's given you and trusted you with. That's it. In closing, I'm out. Nah, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So I have, b before I finish out, I have um, a written prophecy that I want to give. It was given to me earlier. Um, I'm getting stretched in this, so I don't know who this is for. I haven't been given a name or a face or anything like that. I've just been given a word that I wrote down. And so I'm going to read it to you. Um, Joey, you can record this. Um, this is going to be part of the record. Um, this was placed in my heart today for someone. God has seen your toil and the challenges you have faced. His word has not changed and the answer to what you are looking for has already been dispatched. What you have been facing is a lack of sight. As you continue, change your prayer from a request to a declaration and watch God provide you the clarity of the vision, the strategy and the execution. As he was with Moses, he is also with you. Remember that and don't try to clothe yourself in excuses. I don't know who that's for, but that's what I, that's what I was given. I wrote it. I want you to have it. So I'm going to close out in prayer 
to everybody. Y'all can keep your eyes open or closed, whatever you prefer. But Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people. I thank you, God, for giving me the ability to invest back into your children, our brothers and sisters, and for the ability for each one of them to go out with the seeds that you've given them and make an impact for your kingdom positively. I thank you, God, for the clarity of sight, of opportunity. I thank you, God, for the clarity of speech to be able to speak to each one of ourselves and our brothers and sisters. And I ask, Lord God, that as we continue to walk through the path of life, that we will not allow and that, we, that you will put a check in our spirit, that whenever a limitation comes up, that that does not have to be ours. We do not have to make that limitation an authorized user on our behalf to give us additional debt that you didn't require for us to take on. And Father, we thank you and we praise you. We ask, Lord God, that you will continue to protect and minister to our leadership, our Apostle Richie, Pastor Teresa, Pastor Barbara. And Lord, we ask, Lord God, that as you continue to bless them and you continue to minister to them and keep them and preserve them, that they will continue to allow your heart to be delivered to your people. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Prophet.